Today, we're going to talk about three tips for collecting stories from the field, and I have a very special guest, uh, Jeremy. We've actually hung out a few times at the Nonprofit Technology Conference. Jeremy lives in the beautiful city of New York. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to do a quick introduction to, to why we care about storytelling. I know all of you are probably really eager to dive right in, probably already do really great storytelling yourselves, looking for some quick ways to capture things in the field. Um, Rockefeller decided about a, two years ago now that we really wanted to focus our communications team and our, our grantees work on capturing stories from the field because we have a, a platform that can help them expand the impact of their work by sharing things uh, to the media, to our audience, uh, that are showing what their impact is in the field. So we've decided to, to kind of take this on and use our own staff uh, as kind of the guinea pig for how we do this really well. So I work a lot with our program team on how, how they can capture these stories from the field, from really simple and easy things uh, that can be done to the really kind of big campaign-focused stuff. And foundations traditionally had a kind of a history of this because what we used to do is we used to require all program staff to keep daily logs, people they met with, the progress of the work that they're doing. It was basically a professional diary. And probably sometime in the 70s or so, it just stopped being a thing that they did. And that was a lot of lost knowledge. And now we're kind of on a mission to recapture that. How do we do this in a way that's not sending an email, uh, that's not writing a daily log, how can we do this in kind of a nuanced way? And so we came up with this storytelling initiative, and we've tried to make it as transparent and open to everyone as possible. And you'll see a link at the bottom of my slides. Hatchforgood.org has been kind of our collection of resources, tips from the field, and stories, and how you can kind of get started. And so with that, I want to throw a bunch of stuff at you. And feel free to, uh, to call me on anything at the end or ask questions. I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to dive right in. Or send me a tweet as well. So let's start with the who. Uh, I don't think any communication strategist will tell you to start anywhere else. Start with the strategy. Who are you trying to talk to? Why are you doing this? Always keep the audience top of mind. So when you're thinking about your audience, don't assume that your audience knows why you do what you do. Don't assume that you know exactly who you're trying to reach. Use this as an opportunity to kind of lock all of your team into a room, pin up some, some uh, white, white, on a whiteboard or use sticky notes and say, who are we trying to reach? What do we want them to do? really drill down into who those people are. Your general, the general public is never your audience, so you really want to be specific. If you visit Hatch for Good and click on the strategy module, there's a great exercise there that you can complete uh, as a team, and it'll really work to identify the people that you're trying to reach and what you really want them to do. Again, it could be a really great exercise for your team. Just lock yourselves in your boardrooms and kind of go at it, or your meeting rooms. So now you want to identify what your overall message is. What's the underlying theme to the story that you're trying to tell? Oop, go back up. Sorry, John. <laughs> What's the overall theme you're trying to tell, and how do all of your stories tie together? Uh, last year at the NTC, John and I actually led a session. Uh, it was kind of a group conversation about how you use storytelling in your work, and somebody volunteered up what they did, who they worked for, and how disparate all of their stories were. One work stream was working with youth and young adults to get their GEDs. Another was working with youth to be matched into vocational training and apprenticeships. And when she was laying all this out, we both noticed the common theme here is that even, even though some of their individual stories are really compelling, they never really took a step back and recognized the overarching theme was bringing young adults the skills and training necessary for better life life and livelihood. And that was really transformational for their overall narrative strategy. Because now each of their stories could be connected in a strategic way, and their overarching message about what they do, why and how they do it, could really shine through. So pulling all those pieces together, having an image with somebody talking about what they used to do and how your organization helped them, even if it's a different work stream, having that together and having that common theme that says, we help young people do great things by teaching them what they need to get by in life really kind of brings your mission to life and how you impact, how you put a face to that impact. And kind of the last thing on the who is what, uh, what does success look like? What are you really trying to do with your stories on a macro level? What are the goals for sharing more stories? And how do you know what, what you're going to achieve from sharing them? Sometimes that's more money raised, maybe more donors acquired. Uh, maybe it's the impact of your programs. You've fed a thousand more hungry kids because they have access to more free lunch in the summertime. Uh, for web heads like myself, sometimes that's really on more of a micro level. So sometimes it's just the success of a blog post or a piece of social content. By referral traffic to your websites, you're increasing the number of people that are going to your website. 
or maybe it's just an increase in the share of conversation on social media, that your organization is the expert in this field that, that you're curating on, on hunger, on education, things like that. On a micro level, you really want to look at your analytics to tell if your stories are good or if they're just not really catching any fish. If they're bad stories, then you know, stop telling them. Focus on the really good ones. And a really great article on Hatch for Good, you can read all about this, it's the 40-60 rule. Spending 40% of your time creating content and 60% of your time marketing it. And what that means is that you, you don't want to spend weeks upon weeks upon weeks on a blog post. You want to distill down what your message is tell it in a compelling way, and then you want to make sure that all the right people are reading it. And you want to make sure that it's getting out on all the right and appropriate social media and normal traditional media channels. And so to assess pieces of content, you'd use ordinarily Google Analytics. And this uh, item that Garth Moore calls the snake eating the elephant, uh, which is a common uh, children's story. And what that means is in Google Analytics, when you're looking at that piece of content, you want to see the graph have an upward slope for when you first published it, Right? So people are jumping on board, they're reading your blog post, they love your blog post, they're sharing it. And you want to see that slope not necessarily continue to grow. If it continues to grow, awesome. You did a really fabulous job, good for you. But at least continues to, to move along the plane uh, in a positive way. If you see that, that piece of content really spike and then just all of a sudden drop, like a snake eating the elephant there, uh, that's probably not the best use of your time. You don't want to see mountains completely being built and then canceled out in your analytics. You want your content to have a longer lifespan than just the day you publish it. So look at your analytics. If you notice that your, uh, your analytics are showing that your content has a long shelf life, that people are con coming back to it, they're reading it, they're sharing it, even over the long term, might not be as popular as it was when you once published it, but people are still reading it, that's great. That's wonderful content. But if you look at it and you know people looked at it once and then they never came back again, that's probably not the best use of your time for telling a story. You kind of want to move on to something else. So whatever your goals are here, make sure that you're looking at the analytics, and you know who you're talking to and what the overall message is, and that you tie it into a call of action. The call to action is going to be you know, what actually defines whether your storytelling strategy is successful, of course. You don't want to send out um, a story-driven fundraising campaign without including a Donate Now button. So uh, always remember to include your call to action. So now we should move on to the what, the what on storytelling. So your strategy is probably not going to change very often. It's the foundation, the core of your storytelling, the overarching narrative. So now you have to think about what those stories are going to look, sound, or feel like. And a good place to start is how you can best share your impact. That's the most important thing. So find the content that really helps you do, helps you really do this the most. And then share that often with volunteers and donors because you want to keep them inspired and energized to stay engaged. And also encourage them to give you more content. So for everything that you're doing or receiving, make sure that you story bank it. Keep things that you're getting from your volunteers, things that you're getting from maybe your donors are, are also helping out, uh, things that you're getting from your staff or your beneficiaries, make sure you story bank it. And story banks don't have to be um, a super expensive piece of needless technology. They can be super cheap uh, pieces of needless technology. Could be an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, could be some folders in a Dropbox account. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of using Dropbox and Google Drive to collect a lot of this stuff. Uh, at the foundation, our story bank of individual stories is actually housed in an Excel spreadsheet. And then we include a link uh, in the spreadsheet to where it lives on our Box account. So just the most important thing is that you start putting all this content together in a place that you can easily find it. So grab photos from the field, get quotes from people that you're impacting, some videos of your work being done, or statistics from your evaluations, things like that. And remember that it doesn't have to be professional quality stuff. You don't need to commission a photographer to go out in the field to collect all your photos. I mean, that's a lovely thing to have, but chances are you've equipped your staff with one of the most powerful storytelling devices of all, a smartphone. Have them use their smartphone. Have them snap photos in the field. Have them record short videos of things that are happening. Um, have them send quotes and send tweets and Instagram photos and have them use hashtags to collect those things. Because that's a great way to connect the work and the people doing the work in a consistent and curated manner. Okay, and now once you have all those things together, the other important thing is to remember, again, thinking back to what I said about the snake eating the elephant, just like the external content, your internal content 
try to keep the shelf life on that also fairly long. So make sure that once it's collected in your Dropbox, your files, your Excel sheets, wherever, make sure that it's easily searchable and that you can find and reuse items for things like speeches to be used again later in blog posts, for social media, for brochures, direct mailers, among other places. This is kind of your repository, your armory of things that are going to be used for all of your stories going forward. And it's a great way to get more mileage from what you're already doing. So that saves you a lot of time and money when all these things are saved in a place that they can easily find and use again. Another great way to extend your mileage uh, is to look at what you've already created and see how else it can be used. So your report photos from a PDF that you put together a while back, maybe grab those photos and put together a Pinterest board or start sharing them on Instagram with pull quotes from uh, from the report, or maybe make a Facebook album from uh, a slideshow presentation you've done uh, on your last field visit. Uh, take your statistics or your quotes and pair them against some stock photos or photos from your own photo bank and create Twitter or Facebook image macros using a tool like Canva. Uh, or if you're a Photoshop person, you could use Photoshop. It doesn't take very long to do those things, and you'll get a lot of mileage out of that on social media. Uh, and remember all of the different places that you can upload videos and all the different ways you can share them. So never mind what the competition between YouTube and Facebook are. They both have their pros and cons, but there's no reason why you can't use both. You can upload all of your videos to YouTube and kind of use it like many organizations do as a video repository. So if you use YouTube for nothing else, remember that it's a great video repository because you can uh, embed that video onto your website, in your blog posts, it automatically does SEO, it automatically does closed captioning for you. It could be a really powerful tool, even if you're just using it to hold all of your videos and share them on your site. Facebook video, John can give you uh, probably a whole rundown of why Facebook video is awesome, since he's a Facebook expert, and it is awesome. So remember, if you're uploading to YouTube, take another second and upload to Facebook as well, um, because you're going to be hitting another audience there. Don't forget to embed all those snippets again on your website and your blog because no matter where you want to upload and store them, you want people to be able to find them and use them again. You can use them in, in speeches and again in uh, speeches you post on your website, not obviously oratory um, or blog posts. And remember all the different places uh, that you can, or all the different tools you can use that are sometimes free, like iMovie comes with an iPhone or an iPad, uh, comes with new Macs I believe, or YouTube has their own uh, editing tools, and you can start breaking down long-form videos and create social videos out of them. Start looking at your videos that you might already have up and say, is there a 15 or 30 second snippet that is actually just a really awesome quote or a really awesome scene that showcases the work that we do? And once you cut that into 15 or 30 seconds using one of those free tools, again, they're very fast and simple, you can download it and you can share it on Instagram, Vine, Twitter, uh, kind of across the board, and that, that takes that video that you've already worked hard to produce and kind of gives it another life online. So I think what the real takeaway here for content is always be asking yourself, how else can I use this? Whatever content you're collecting from the field, how else can it be used? And the final thing here is where. When you're looking at, when you're looking at content, where does your audience hang out? What, uh, what assets do you have at your disposal? Most of us are going to be on the blog. Uh, we all have websites. Uh, most of our organizations will have social media or email. You probably participate in some form or fashion in the real world, going to conferences, sending out mailers, brochures. You want to remember that those are all opportunities for you to engage your audience. But don't just limit yourself to one or two, right? Just because you spend all day on your website probably doesn't mean everybody that you intend to reach spends all day on your website. So try to spread the pain around for all the places that you want to be and try to think creatively about how you can use things. So take still shots from your videos and use those still shots as images for your website so you have some high quality stuff that you can share. But then also use those images for your brochures and direct mailers. Uh, share the video then on social media or put a link to the video an email. Think about all the different places that you can contain that content where it lives online and then use it in all those different forms. So in everything that you do, also remember to make it easy for people to share. When you send, when you create a blog post, make sure that your share buttons are front and center. There are tools like click to tweet uh, that help you pre-populate 
Twitter content. So when you put that button at the bottom of your blog post, you're empowering your supporters to share your blog. Um, make sure that your social media, your tweets and links include things like images or videos that are they're more likely to be shared by people and make it sure that the content itself is short enough that when I click retweet, I can do so, maybe even have a little commentary. An email, always include an action step. Share to Facebook, share to Twitter, donate now is usually a pretty common one, but occasionally share a story with a donor or volunteer that doesn't ask them to donate. Just ask them to share the content for you. So always have a call to action and always remember to be where your supporters are and think about where that content uh, makes the most sense across that platform. Now I'm going to, to wrap up because I think I'm already over time. <laughs> um, so just kind of keep in mind these, these three tips. When your team's headed out of the field, ask them to bring you back one quote or one photo or one phone shot video of what's going on. Use quick capture to help build your story bank and provide easy content to share on social media. Secondly, build your story bank. Things you can go back to later for use on your site or stories that you can share during interviews, speeches, or blog posts. And third, always remember to reuse your old content. Take a look back through analytics, see what could be reused in other media, or be updated to look like it's new again. Not everything you've used before is dated and should be buried on your website. So remember, social media is not a fire and forget tool. And with that, I shall close.